All right. A um, little problem here with uh, Facebook, but it seems like it's okay now. It wouldn't let me on at first, but now it repented and, and it did. So I guess we're okay. Um, okay, first uh, question for tonight from a fellow geek, Z Stallone. It says, who were the Levites? Are they responsible for Leviticus? Indeed they are, right? It's a handbook for the Levites and the priests, how to do stuff um, ritually and so on. Did they get their name from Leviathan or vice versa? I think uh, it's what you first suggested. The, uh, what is, uh, first, what does Leviathan mean? It's a seven-headed dragon that is a personification of the uh, river Litani, which I believe forms the boundary between Syria and Lebanon today. And uh, it has various tributaries, uh, which are uh, the basis for the idea of the seven long necks of the dragon. Uh, sometimes the Old Testament speaks of uh, uh, Yahweh combating not Leviathan, but Yom, the sea personified. It's really two ways of saying the same thing because both are like the Greek hydra, which means water again, right? And um, so uh, Litani or, uh, oh, what's the, uh, I guess that's the, the original name. Yeah, I'm thinking there was another variant, but it escapes me if there was. Uh, but um, so the, the river Litani is still there. Occasionally you hear it mentioned on news out of the Middle East. And well, uh, of course, it's very old, as rivers tend to be. Uh, and uh, it, it, we read in Job very briefly uh, when Job is wishing he'd never been born. Things have gone so rotten for him. Uh, he says, uh, I wish those who are skilled to rouse up Leviathan uh, would cancel that day. It, it would take some magic to do it, apparently, is what they mean. Uh, well, who are they? Well, presumably, they're, uh, they're uh, priests of the god Leviathan. Well, how do we know there was a god Leviathan? Because apparently, that was another name for uh, Nehushtan, who was offered sacrifices of incense, just as Yahweh was, and apparently various other ones, in the Jerusalem temple until, jeez, uh, I always mix them up, Hezekiah and Josiah, the, the identical stories practically told them I'm, that they conducted a great um, monolatrous reform that they had gradually accumulated various gods worshipped as part of the Israelite pantheon in the Temple of Solomon. Each had his own little chapel and so forth. Uh, and it says that um, that as part of this reform, the bronze serpent called Leviathan was put out to the curb with the junk. Uh, and um, what bronze serpent? Doesn't that ring a bell? Well, uh, this was uh, sort of guiltily explained away at one point with a story about Moses uh, curing the snake bite of his people when God got ticked off at him and sent seraphim, in this case meaning blazing serpents or poisonous serpents, uh, among the people to uh, bite them and uh, kill them. Uh, but um, uh, Moses interceded with God and he said, well, okay, here's what you do. Why don't you make a bronze effigy of, of one of these serpents and put it on a pole and hold it up and tell everybody, if you look at this, that will um, negate the poison. It's what's called an apotropaic device. That is a turning away device. And, uh, and this is followed up in the Gospel of John, right? That uh, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man be lifted up, and everyone who looks at him will be saved. Um, well, there was, um, uh, so, so we've got uh, Leviathan from uh, the, uh, the word uh, um, 
Levi, meaning serpent, and we've got Nahushtan from another Hebrew word meaning serpent, Nahash. In fact, you find names of various kings uh, in there, like uh, uh, Nahash, king of the Ammonites, and so on. Uh, that uh, that implies he was uh, his family worshipped uh, Nahash. Also, um, Rahab it appears to be the same or another one of the same kind. Uh, and um, as our old Bible geek pal, Dr. Barton, once pointed out to me, Rahab the harlot you know, in, uh, in Joshua, why uh, would she be named the same name as a dragon? Apparently another name for Leviathan. Uh, and uh, well, it's probably because she was a sacred prostitute uh, in the service of, uh, of Nehushtan, Leviathan, Rahab and all of which are mentioned uh, in connection with the combat myth. God, thou who crushes the heads of Leviathan, and uh, in Isaiah talks about him uh, uh, conquering uh, Rahab uh, uh, when uh, during the Exodus and so forth, uh, implying that God's dividing the sea is part of the a primordial myth of the combat again, that he defeated Yom, the sea, uh, and uh, that Rahab was the, the sea, and, and that uh, when, like in C.B. DeMille's great movie, uh, The Ten Commandments, the waters rear up on either side, and the Israelites can pass through um, on dry ground. Uh, that's probably a, a sort of an adaptation of the combat myth whereby Yahweh created the world from the carcass of the dragon. This is, is historicizing it, making uh, Rahab the dragon into Egypt uh, and uh, enough of a monster in uh, Israelite eyes. Okay, so uh, there were priests who, who were priests of Leviathan. In Ezekiel, we hear that the Levites were uh, demoted, apparently after Josiah's reform, and that they remained priestlings, you might say, or temple flunkies, uh, second order characters, sextons, night watchmen, uh, choir singers, hymn singers, hymn writers, uh, uh, giving uh, incense periodically like uh, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist does in Luke. Uh, they weren't um, Levitical priests anymore. Uh, that trajectory is followed up in Numbers, I think it is, where Korah, who is one of the Levites, has a labor dispute with Moses and Aaron and says, why can't we offer sacrifice? Why has it got to be Aaron and his, uh, his sons and Moses? Only them? Uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, Moses said, okay, let's try a little experiment. Uh, Aaron and I will offer um, sacred fire, I think it was, uh, tomorrow at the tabernacle, and uh, you and your buddies do the same, and we'll see who's, uh, uh, it's very much like Elijah and the prophets of Baal, let's see whose sacrifice will, uh, will catch fire miraculously without any uh, tinder, uh, etc. Uh, if it's, if, if uh, the sacrifice to Baal, uh, suddenly spontaneously bursts into flame. Okay, that means Baal blessed your efforts and he is the proper God. But uh, if uh, Yahweh does, uh, that'll prove that he's the one for Israel to worship. Same thing here. Um, so uh, what happens? Well, uh, not only does God reject the uh, attempted offering of Korah, uh, but he causes the ground to open up under their feet and they slide down the chute to Sheol alive. Well, I guess that settles that one. Uh, and so it was a labor dispute, basically. But they had been demoted historically um, uh, um, after Josiah's uh, reform. You guys were the priests of this particular God who is now forbidden. 
Uh, and uh, so, okay, you can still be pre uh, priests of a sort, but not actually sacrificing to God. You weren't anyway, right? You were fans of the snake god. Uh, okay. And, and of course, he turns out to be uh, demythologized to some degree by being the snake in the Garden of Eden. All right. I hope I've totally confused you there. I think I've probably succeeded in that. Okay, so uh, that is probably the historical origin of the Levites. Uh, but even that was uh, kind of uh, worrisome. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, weren't we always good uh, monotheists? Uh, sure we were. So that can't be uh, the origin of the Levites. Uh, and so various attempts were made to re-explain it. One was that the Levites were never priests, they, it, it, but they were kahin, uh, kohanes, which means both priest and oracle monger, fortune teller. And uh, so uh, in uh, the book of Judges, we're told about a guy who was a professional Levite and uh, could uh, give you answers from God and, and so on. And so he was uh, hired by one guy to uh, live in the house with the family and uh, so they could rely on him to get, you know, I guess who'd be, who'd be winning the horse races next week, whatever, who'd win the World Series. Uh, and uh, so that was one. There, there were a guild of uh, psychically gifted oracles. Uh, well, then there was another one. Remember when um, we had uh, Moses lose it when he saw that the he's coming down the Mount Sinai with the uh, tablets of the law, uh, which he expects a big uh, round of applause for, but instead, uh oh, uh, under the uh, watchful eye of Aaron, looks like they've made a golden calf. Uh, to represent Yahweh, and now they're having some sort of ecstatic orgy, which is often what worship degenerated to for hundreds of years. That's why men and women were s sitting in different areas of the synagogue. <laughs> Uh, unbelievable. Uh, people tell me that uh, when they used to go to Pentecostal youth uh, celebrations, uh, camping out, that often they'd be sneaking off into the woods for a little uh, pornea. And so I guess uh, you, you start whooping it up and uh, fly off the handle, anything can happen. Well, Moses then says, okay, enough of this. And he's says, all who want to be faithful to Yahweh, come over here by me. And apparently they're all armed. And he said, I want you to kill all those people who have lapsed into idolatry. And loads and loads of them meet a bloody death. But the ones who were willing to execute them won the right to be priests to God. So that was the origin of the Levites. Well, then uh, yet another one says that they were simply the tribe of the descendants of the patriarch Levi, one of the sons of Jacob. Uh, so uh, when you've got a bunch of different answers, it it's becomes pretty evident that uh, they either didn't know what the real origin was or they found it shameful or embarrassing. Uh, by later standards. And so it seems to me out of all of these, the it, probably the Ezekiel thing where they were demoted for having worshiped a God that was once legitimate, but isn't anymore. And by now, I think you've heard my little theory that the uh, serpent of Eden was Nehushtan slash Leviathan, but he had been kind of half demythologized. And um, uh, let's see. Yeah, and that it must have been a one of these demoted priests of Leviathan who wrote this story, because if you look at it closely, it becomes pretty evident that, uh, that the serpent is the self-sacrificing Promethean hero, the benefactor of poor, shivering humanity, whereas God, the creator, uh, not that nice a guy, uh, not big on the truth.
uh, to protect his private stash of, of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, he tells uh, the man and the woman, keep your mitts off of this thing because uh, I, I'm only looking out for you because if you ate it, uh, took a bite, you would drop dead on the spot. Now, you wouldn't want to do that, would you? Uh, and later the, uh, the serpent uh, says to them, uh, so... You're the new caretakers, huh? Uh, can are you free to eat on all these trees? Though they're, you know, they're there for the gods to, to eat, but will they share it with you? And they said, "Well, yeah." Eve says, "Yes, uh, with one exception. We're not allowed to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil because we're told it's poison. You eat it, you're dead." Uh, and uh, the serpent says, "What? Who told you that? That's that's not true." Uh, if if you eat it, something will happen, all right, but something good. Your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods, knowing good and evil. And once the woman, it says, uh, saw that the that it wasn't poison, that it was the fruit was good for food. Uh, and an additional, another benefit, it would make you wise. She said, well, okay, don't mind if I do, crunch. And then she gives some to her husband with her. And uh, oh, that evening, Yahweh comes down for his uh, sunset constitutional where he walks with me and he talks with me uh, in, in the garden, right? And uh, uh, and uh, but he can't find the man in the warm. Hey, what, what the heck? Where is everybody? Uh, no omniscience here, right? This is not uh, written by some philosophical theologian. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, the man says, over here, uh, what are you doing in the bushes? <laughs> well, uh, I suddenly discovered I had no clothes on, and that was pretty embarrassing. And, oh, I said, wait a minute. Who told you you were naked? Because animals don't really know they're naked, right? They are, but uh, who cares? They don't even have that category, really, right? So they've passed a threshold. They know something they shouldn't know. And he says, I bet you ate of that, true that, I, uh, that tree that I said was off limits, didn't you? And he says, uh, 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 that's right, God. Uh, but it was really the woman's fault. She's the one that gave me this stuff. Uh, and then, you know, is this true, uh, lady? And she says, well, yeah, but uh, I was tricked by the snake. He said it would be okay. <laughs> okay, that's not going to cut any ice here. And he starts handing out the punishments. What is, is the writer to the testimony of truth? No, I think it's the origin of the world in Nag Hammadi. It's a retelling, one of several, of the Eden stories. It uh, comments on this and says, uh, apparently the last person who ever understood what the story was actually saying, that God is lying to protect his own prerogatives. Uh, and uh, it was the serpent who, to the benefit of the human race, gave him knowledge, uh, but was punished for it. He became a martyr. And the, the, the writer says, what, what sort of a God is this? Is he not a malicious grudger? Well, yeah. Who would have written a story like that? A story in which God is the triumphant one, but not a good guy. Uh, and where uh, the one who induces them to disobey him in order to become wise suffers for it. Well, uh, I can only think of one sort of person, someone who was a priest of uh, the serpent god, a, a symbol of wisdom universally, uh, and uh, had to admit, you know, I'm lucky I wasn't fired altogether. So in my story, you know, Yahweh is God. He's the chief of the gods, all right. But uh, my favorite, Nehushtan, uh, he's the real hero of the story. He's the real friend of mankind. Uh, so uh, that's more than you wanted to know. But yeah, that's uh, that was a Levite priest. Uh, and uh, so that those are the options as to where it came from. But it does mean serpent, the serpent of wisdom. Yeah. All right. Uh, boy, I love that uh, whole topic. Mm. Z. Stallone says, what do fundamentalists get correct that liberal Protestants get wrong? Um, and then let's answer that one first. Uh, let's see. I, 
I, I think the big thing is that their Kantians, in their view of the religion of the Bible, Kant was raised a German pietist, but he studied philosophy and he wound up uh, sort of allegorizing the traditional theological concepts. For instance, in his book, um, Religion Within the Bounds of Reason Alone, uh, he says, don't you see that the whole thing is figurative? Uh, when it says that uh, uh, Jesus... Um, must skip the baptism. Jesus uh, died, and and well, uh, when it talks about the incarnation, what does that really mean? Uh, it's uh, if you regard it as an exception to the human condition, what's the relevance of it? And uh, he said, no, it, it must be about the human condition that uh, God is incarnate in you, uh, but. Uh, we uh, that's a surprise because we've all become so mired in naive selfishness to one degree or another. And uh, so that was the incarnation. By the way, the ancient Naasin said the same thing uh, nearly 2,000 years before. I don't know if he knew about them. And uh, uh, let's see. And um, when Jesus died uh, for sins and rose from the dead, what's that really about? Well, he's the son of man, the man, the human being, the archetypal human. And uh, when he dies, it, it is uh, figurative for repenting that uh, we die to our old sinful self when we reach a moment of self-realization. It's like, geez, I got to straighten out here. Uh, and uh, and then when you rise, it's the you you should have been. You're now doing what you were made to do. He says, that's really the point of it. I mean, it just think of the difficulty making any literal metaphysical sense out of an innocent man dying to somehow lift the burden of guilt from you who have plenty of actual sins. What? How is that justice? This just doesn't make any sense. Uh, whereas what uh, Kant said does. But it, uh, he says it's kind of like a fairy tale teaching this truth. And if you understand the truth, uh, you don't really need the fairy tale anymore. If somebody does need it to get the point, good, that's fine. It's nothing bad about the story. But uh, if you realize that's what's going on in it, uh, well, you get the point, and that's really all you need. Uh, and uh, so this made, for Kant, uh, ethics, morality, central, absolutely fundamental to religion. And... Uh, uh, that's that figures into what he said about uh, love being the central tenet of all religions, uh, whereas like all the religions seem to agree that that's true. But then why are they having religious wars and hatred all the time? Well, it's because they're putting the emphasis where it does not belong. They're straining out gnats and swallowing camels. Uh, they think, oh, you don't believe in Jesus as the son of God. He's just a great prophet. Well, I'm afraid you're going to hell, buddy. Uh, oh, you uh, believe that uh, Muhammad was more of a great teacher than Jesus and that that uh, he's the one we ought to follow? Uh, uh, I, I'm afraid not. Uh, you, you're, you're going to hell, too and so on and so on. Uh, Kant said, what is this? Is love the sum of the law, right? Uh, what does Jesus say? First commandment, no other God but the one God. Second commandment, the runner-up, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Everybody says that, but they wind up killing each other. You see what's happened? They're majoring in minors. Uh, they think that the parable, trying to get the the, the point of uh, moral repentance and living is the the point, not, not a vehicle to make a point. It's the point. Well, that's what Paul Tillich would later say is idolatrous faith. Uh, 
Um, it may be your ultimate concern, but what you're concerned with is not rightly ultimate. And so you're going to crash and burn at some point. Okay, all that to say, it seems to me liberal Protestantism and even Catholicism today is more and more a reduction of religion to ethics. Uh, Schleiermacher and later Karl Barth, as different as they were, uh, agreed on this, that uh, though ethics is indispensable in religion, you got to have it, that isn't the essence of religion. Uh, the You don't have religion if you don't have what um, Schleiermacher called the feeling of absolute dependence. Uh, or uh, absolute receptivity to God, or God consciousness, he called it. Uh, he also spoke of it as a sense and taste for the infinite, an intuitive grasp of your total dependence upon the, the vast divine sum of all things. He was pretty close to being a, a Spinozist pantheist. Uh, and he said, it's that intuitive sense of, of spirituality that makes it religion. Uh, you might not think you need religion, and uh, you may be getting along just fine without it, but uh, if you say you're religious, but it really just means you're into green politics or, or right-wing patriotism, I, I, that may be important, but that's not religion. And it seems to me that... Uh, uh, some ultra-rightist fundamentalists have deified the... Uh, I, I always think it's odd when somebody puts out a, an edition of the Bible that contains the Constitution, the Declaration, and the Bill of Rights. And there have been a couple. I think a new one just came out. That's part of the Bible? Uh, that's, I, I think that's a misfire. Uh, I, I would say, personally, that the Constitution... It ought to be treated as inerrant and authoritative, um, whereas I'm way past that on the Bible. Uh, but uh, the uh, that seems to me to be a politicizing, a moralizing of religion, which threatens the uniquely religious character of religion. But um, politically correct Protestantism, which is like what used to be the mainstream of of uh, liberal Protestantism, it's now shrinking more and more, but used to be called mainline Protestantism, though it is, there are not enough of them anymore to, to use that term. But they seem to me uh, to have reduced it uh, to, to ethics or even politics and extreme left-wing politics. And I think it's not really religion anymore, unless you want to say it's idolatrous faith, making politics into a religion. But that's just a fancy way of saying you've, you've lost the essentially religious. And I think that's why a lot of uh, Unitarians who were kind of the archetypal liberal Protestants uh, and uh, and other people in Presbyterian, Congregationalist, Methodist, etc. denominations, uh, they um, I think that's why a lot of them are really worshiping social justice or what passes for it and or new age religion uh, they've uh, they've seen traditional beliefs destroyed and uh, they go on to find something else to replace it uh, francis schaefer once said in a little booklet called uh, the new super spirituality and he, he was thinking about the cults, like the this was written in the uh, 70s. He's thinking of the Hare Krishnas, the children of God, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, some of them Christian, some not, but extreme. Uh, he says, when you stop believing uh, in uh, Christianity, you don't start believing in nothing. No, you believe anything. And there's a point to that. That doesn't prove fundamentalist Christianity was right, but it does kind of re reflect what has happened in, uh, in the religious confusion uh, of uh, our day. Uh, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, by the way. Uh, I get a big 
uh, kick out of uh, new age people I know. They they all uh, seem to be open minded and inquisitive. And their hearts in the right place, uh, even though I don't share their uh, beliefs, which seem to me kind of uh, pseudo scientific. I I like them. They're they're really nice people, fresh uh, thinking souls, you might say. Uh, but. Um, and anything else, I, I rejoice to meet somebody from a religion where I've never known anybody in it. And uh, so, you know, I, it's fine with me that we now have a, uh, well, uh, as one book title put it, a spiritual supermarket. What the heck? All right. Now, second part of the question, Z Stallone asked, what are some things that fundamentalists get correct that atheist scholarship misses the mark on or ignores? Well, uh, the big thing there is that they regard uh, any kind of orthodox Christianity as inherently oppressive and exploitive, tyrannical. And uh, there's certainly reason to think that. Look at the sorry history of inquisitions, religious wars, monkey trials, and things like that. But uh, I have enough sympathy for the uh, religious, uh, the traditional religionists to say that that's uh, an abuse of it. Uh, they're the first to admit they, they're they not completely sanctified, uh, that, uh, you know, I'm not perfect, I'm striving for it, but you're certainly going to see a lot of regrettable nonsense from me if you look long enough. Uh, and so that kind of mitigates it a bit, it doesn't excuse anything, but uh, you can't uh, use the old... Uh, well, I remember in the neighborhood we used to live in, uh, the girls had a, a young friend uh, whose stepfather, I think, was an abusive drunk, uh, though he had just uh, accepted Jesus as his savior. But they thought he was really just a hypocrite. I mean, if he had really been you know, reborn in the spirit, etc., he wouldn't treat his wife this way. And I said, well, uh, keep in mind that this guy is trying to navigate a total reversal of his lifestyle. It, it doesn't happen overnight. So uh, let's hope he uh, puts the brakes on it, but uh, he isn't simply a hypocrite, right? A hypocrite makes pretense of being righteous and thinks he is when he's not, uh, or he would have you think he is when he's not. It's just a show though he may be the audience as well as the actor, right? Uh, but uh, it's not that easy. And uh, so uh, that's, uh, so I give him a break in, in that regard. Uh, so I, I don't think you can demand perfection from people and then excoriate them when they're not absolutely perfect. Same thing with the Bible. I did an article, an essay once called, Is the Bible Mein Kampf? Uh, is it as bad as the satanic Bible? Uh, no. Uh, atheists uh, often, I mean, if there's plenty of them, I don't know what the proportion is, who seem to think, oh yeah, that Bible, it's, uh, if I believed in the devil, I'd say he wrote it. It's so bad. Now, come on. Y you can't read uh, passages in Isaiah and Jeremiah and the Sermon on the Mount and so forth and come away thinking that. Uh, you're just vilifying it. And, and so there, and, and cheating yourself out of some uh, real wisdom that's available there. Uh, so that's one of the biggies, I'd say. They caricature religion and the Bible uh, to their, their own disadvantage. Yeah, okay. Hmm. Okay, uh, Peter Rabbit, as you referenced this morning, it seems plausible that the Gospels slash the Twelve follow Paul, not the other way. Does this follow mythicist, uh, mythicist belief that Jesus started off as a spiritual being and was made human after? Well, that's the theory I uh, promote uh, in my uh, book. Uh, gee, which one is it? It's, it's I don't, is it Judaizing Jesus or, yeah, I think it is. Or I have a similar uh, section in 
uh, the Gospels behind the Gospels. Speaking of my books, by the way, I, I finally got a uh, confirmation that my Houses of the Holy is supposed to come out in, in the autumn. And uh, so it's not just indefinite, it, uh, still a bit of a wait, but uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, my theory is that uh, Paul was Simon Magus, of course, it's not original with me, and uh, that he had been part of the Qumran community of whom John the Baptist was the guru. And uh, Simon was, uh, Simon, Paul, uh, he was... Um, uh, the the uh, next in line to, to take over the sect once John should pass away. Uh, there can only be 30 members at a time, which indicates some kind of lunar connection. Not lunacy, but uh, the lunar calendar, for instance, which was a big, big thing, a uh, big point of debate back then, solar or lunar. Well, at any rate, uh, he was to take over, but it turned out that John was uh, martyred unexpectedly while Simon happened to be off in Egypt studying more uh, ma magic, miracles, whatever, Gnosticism. And uh, when he got back, he, what, John's dead? Uh, uh, who's running the show? Uh, and they say, well, it's, it's Dosithius of Samaria here. And, oh, uh, Dosithius, huh? Well, Simon tried to be a good sport and... Uh, made way for, for him, though technically he should have been the next guy. But eventually he began to feel disappointed with Dosithius and said, look, I I'm sorry, but I don't think you're up to the job. Uh, and, uh, oh, you don't, huh? You're envious, eh? Tell you what, let's have a miracle contest here and now. We'll see who is the standing one. In other words, uh, the great power of God, as uh, Simon claimed to be. Uh, and so they had a sword fight. Um, Dosithius swung his blade at uh, Simon, and it just bounced right off as if it were some sort of uh, uh, Nerf sword. Uh, uh, and then he uh, tried again, uh, and uh, the, his sword went right through him as if he was made of ice cream, but came out the other side, and Simon was unharmed. And uh, so he said, okay, okay, uh, I know when I'm defeated, you, you are the standing one. Uh, you're the rightful heir to John the Baptist. Okay, I'll, I'll pack my bags and hang out a shingle elsewhere. And he did and started the Docithian sect, which lasted uh, in one form or another for a few centuries. Uh, okay, so Simon Magus then uh, uh, made certain reforms in the discipline of the sect. Uh, namely, he said, uh, you know, there are, there are various Gentiles that believe in, in our God, the biblical God, um, but they don't really want to get circumcised and so on. I mean, what does that have to do really with, uh, it's our tradition, but is there really any spiritual benefit to that? I don't think so. I mean, we do it because we're Jews, but these guys aren't, and they would like to be initiated. And so he let them. And uh, the others said, uh-oh, wait a second here. I'll tell you what this is exactly like was when Elijah Muhammad, the founder of the Nation of Islam, you know, the black Muslim so-called, uh, uh, when he died, uh, his son, Warith Dean Muhammad, took over, and uh, he began to uh, make various reforms, bringing uh, their form of Islam, which was pretty eccentric, in line more with uh, Sunni Islam. And they began to receive a lot of aid from them and so on. And um, But there were dissatisfied people, including Louis Farrakhan, and uh, he said, I, this is not what uh, most of us signed up for. If you're going to take it in this direction, we're saying goodbye. We're going to revive your father's version. And he did. So you now have the two groups, the Nation of Islam and Bilalian Islam, named for Bilal, the, the first known black African Muslim, uh, back going to Muhammad's disciples. And uh, so you still have them. I don't know what the relative 
statistics are for either one of them. But that's what happened uh, in my theory here, that uh, Simon began to do what Warith Dean Muhammad did and uh, started reforming the thing. Uh, but uh, the others didn't like it. That was too much for them. And as it says in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the spouter of lies, the mocker who mocked the Torah in their view, um, caused a split within the community because he started recruiting the simple ones of Ephraim, uh, namely uh, Gentiles, God-fearers. Come on in. You don't have to worry about all this kosher stuff and so on. Uh, hey, that's cheap grace, as Bonhoeffer would call it. You telling these people they can have this discount ticket to heaven, ah, it's heresy. And he said, well, if that's the way of you, sayonara, I'll go and market my gospel elsewhere. Well, one thing you need to know, as the Dead Sea Scrolls make clear, the Qumran community, Essenes, Zealots, whoever they were, Christians, uh, they um, were governed by a council of 12 uh, and within that, there was a count, an inner circle of three, uh, which kind of reminds us of the 12 disciples or apostles and the three pillars, Cephas, James, and John. And uh, the, the names of those three, the pillars, implies that they were the link to heaven. Uh, they, uh, the axis mundi. On the one hand, James and John were the sons of, of Zebedee, yes, but also called the sons of thunder. What does that mean? Well, apparently, uh, plus their name in uh, Aramaic would mean, or, or in, uh, oh, uh, going back to Sumerian, even more ancient, would mean upholders of the vault of heaven. So in short, they were... Castor and Pollux, the, the brothers, and uh, they were pillars like the two pillars in the Jerusalem temple, Boaz and Jacob, who uphold the, uh, of course, the temple is like a microcosmic model of the universe. And so they were the pillars that upheld the firmament. Cephas, or Peter, is the rock. Well, what rock is that? Not the wrestler, uh, not the boxer, but uh, rather the navel stone which marked the center of the world, they thought. It was a big stone stopper, basically, at the center of the temple, and they believed that if it were ever to be pried open, the waters of the Tahom, the, the deep from which creation emerged, they would uh, gush out like a cosmic geyser, which is just what happened with Noah's flood. It would be, the world would be destroyed again. Uh, and so, you know, God had promised that wouldn't happen. So you better leave that thing alone. Uh, well, Peter is named for that. You, you, that's what it says in one of the pastoral epistles, something about the gospel being the pillar and ground of the, of the truth. Well, it's the same imagery. Uh, and uh, so Without any Jesus in the picture, this is what I'm getting at, the three uh, bigwigs in the Qumran community were already cosmic links to, to God. Uh, you didn't really need any other mediator. So where did, uh, well, how did Jesus eventually fit into this? Irenaeus tells us that, um, uh, that uh, Simon Magus taught that you need not keep the Torah because it was the invention of angels, not God, which is just what we hear in Galatians, right, to the letter, basically. And, uh, uh, and therefore, these laws were not uh, binding on those who were true Gnostics, who really understood where the law came from, where the world came from, etc. And he said that he was the latest manifestation or incarnation, whatever, of God, the great power. And uh, that in the Old Testament period, he had manifested himself as the Father in the previous generation, 
of the first century, he had appeared as the son, and it was he who suffered, though only apparently, on the cross. And of course, he, this must be the original meaning of the Simon of Cyrene bearing the cross for Jesus. Um, and, uh, and then now he was manifest as the spirit. Uh, so Irenaeus says this stuff that, that I, I don't know if he understood how close it was to uh, early Christianity. And he, he claimed that he got this, um, you know, from, from divine revelation that awakened him to his identity, presumably, and that, uh, that he was uh, Christ the Redeemer. So how does Jesus then get transferred over to the Qumran community, which was apparently the same as the Jerusalem Apostolic Church? Well, um, you'll remember from Acts that the Jerusalem church had a communitarian structure. Everybody that had any expensive possessions or any real estate would cash it in and put the money in a common fund, which is exactly what the Dead Sea Scrolls community did. Uh, and because uh, maybe they were the same. But uh, you know what Margaret Thatcher said? The big problem with socialism is that sooner or later you run out of other people's money. And uh, so they were, they found themselves impoverished. They didn't have secular jobs. Remember, Jesus said, you got to leave all of that behind. Uh, so uh, they needed an, an infusion of denarii as soon as possible. And so uh, once Paul slash Simon showed that his gospel was fabulously successful, that he had created a network of congregations all over the Mediterranean world. Uh, they, somebody on one side or the other said, let's uh, have a rapprochement. Let, let's negotiate here. Uh, and the, the Jerusalem pillars said, well, how about this? Um, You've got a lot more constituents. You're really doing something right there. Uh, how about if you pay tribute to us, the Mother Church, by taking up a collection for our financial relief among your congregations? And of course, that's often mentioned in the Pauline epistles that he does just that, right? And uh, and in return, we will recognize your apostolic ministry. You just keep preaching to these non-Jews, and we'll stick with, you know, governing the 12 tribes of Israel, as Jesus said. Uh, and and so he said, well, all right, but there, if there's, uh, you've got to, re that means recognizing me as the, the incarnation of the crucified Jesus. Uh, and uh, he, you have to promote him as the true Messiah. Well, we've already got these uh, great saintly leaders, James, John, and Cephas. Uh, what, what else do we need? Well, uh, they, they can still be part of it, but they're, uh, let's say, disciples of Jesus. Yeah, that's it. Um, uh, they'll have to follow my teaching or, or whatever. Well, they agreed and gave them the, the handshake for it. And that's why you now have what uh, Martin Note used to call uh, the redundancy principle, uh, where a story had heroes before, but it gets retold uh, when a new hero comes along and the others are not cut from the story, but are shoved out of the spotlight. And uh, that's why in Exodus, it's suddenly it's Moses and Aaron going in to demand freedom from the Pharaoh. Though uh, the first time they forgot to change it, it was just the elders of Israel. Uh, and so what do they need uh, uh, Moses and Aaron for? Well, they were the main characters and uh, now, and so the other guys were sort of shoved to the side. Uh, okay, uh, that's what happened here. Uh, you can still have the pillars and the rock, but they have to be understood as lieutenants of Jesus. Now, he's not here anymore, right? I mean, in a previous life, I was he. 
but uh, you know, now I'm somebody else somewhere else. So you uh, are to promote Jesus as the resurrected and ascended Messiah. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, you're second only to him, which means me. And, uh, they needed the money and they said, well, what harm can it do? Oh, okay. Uh, you're an apostle too. Uh, well, things seemed to be going okay until we have, uh, what Paul talks about in Galatians the same epistle in which he says the law was given by angels, not by God, and, and so forth. He uh, uh, says there that uh, he thought he had this accord worked out with the so-called pillars, as he puts it, whom he doesn't much care for anymore. And he said, things were going okay until uh, I found out that certain emissaries from James, who had apparently replaced Peter as one of the, the pillars, uh, that uh, uh, um, that James had sent emissaries around to Paul slash Simon's congregations saying, uh, I hear you guys were uh, brought to, to Christ by uh, good old Paul. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Sh sure is. Uh, and uh, they said, well, you know, that's really just step one. I don't know if he thought you were ready for this, but we think you are. You know, you have to become Jewish proselytes to be followers of the Jewish Messiah, right? Circumcision, kosher laws, uh, step right up. Uh, I'm sharpening the scalpel. Uh, and uh, so some of them did. Uh, and uh, Paul hears about this and says, son of a bitch. What? They're knifing me in the back. These so-called pillars, they, they mean nothing to me. Uh, so that was the end of that. Now, why did they do that? Well, it's not too hard to infer uh, because they said, wait a minute, if we could get them all not to be the simple ones of Ephraim disregarding the Torah anymore. They would look to us and we would have a whole bunch of Qumrans all over the place and we wouldn't have to take tribute from their congregations. They would just directly donate to us. We could eliminate this cuckoo's the middleman. That's what I think happened. I realize it's simply a speculative theory, but to me that makes the most sense of most of the evidence. Uh, if it sounds wacky, maybe it is, I don't know, but that's what makes the, the most sense of a lot of uh, strange bits of evidence that make seem to make no sense on any other understanding. So you didn't know what kind of genie you were letting out of the bottle with that one. Uh, so that's how Jesus came in to supplement the uh, uh, the uh, apostles and so on. Yeah, so here they're taking the spiritual Christ uh, who docetically seemed to die on the cross, uh, and though um, apparently it was a fiction uh, of, of Simon's, and they said, well, he must have been a real uh, human being, and uh, and these guys represent, uh, the pillars represent his disciples who heard the truth from the horse's mouth, not like this Paul, not well, what a mistake that was. Okay. Mm. Okay, uh, this is from the learned Z Stallone, he says, what is the feast of unleavened bread? What is the origin? Why was it one of the Ten Commandments? Was it a fertility festival? Does it have any connection to Osiris slash Bacchus eating uh, the body of the gods of bread in the form of bread and wine? I don't think it does, but uh, the, the Passover feast, I think, is a Judaization of the sacramental feasts of Dionysus and uh, and Osiris, who were vegetation gods, so the the wine or beer in Osiris's case, that was both there, only wine in uh, Dionysus, I think, is because the blood of the grape 
is the blood of uh, of the the god of the grape, right? Uh, Dionysus or Bacchus. Uh, and the beer, same thing, the blood of the wheat and the, the bread, obviously, the body of the uh, of the, the wheat. And uh, the God is the wheat and the grain. Uh, so uh, I think the uh, the gospel redefinition of uh, the Passover does have to do with that. Um, the uh, the uh, festival of unleavened bread appears to be much older than that. And if you look close at the uh, story of its institution, well, I don't know if it is the institution, but the origin of it in Exodus, it's connected to the plagues uh, because uh, Moses and Aaron are asking Yul Brenner for permission to, uh, to leave Egypt only temporarily to go out uh, into the desert to celebrate a feast that uh, the Egyptians find abhorrent. We don't want to offend them, and we don't want to arouse their wrath at us. Well, the firstlings of the flock, that was part of it, but the, the first fruits of the ground, uh, including uh, the unleavened bread, that was part of it too. And the point was you celebrated the, uh, the wheat harvest by making pure bread out of it with no leaven. It had to be in its pure original form as uh, unleavened bread, and you were offering it and sharing the sacrifice with God um, to thank him for the successful wheat harvest. And the idea was, by your showing your gratitude, you were making God more likely to uh, make it an even better harvest next time. And the same with the grapes and the same with the lambs. And uh, so already in Exodus, even in Egypt, the, the uh, Hebrews are already uh, celebrating these agricultural festivals. But then they get changed within the same narrative to commemorate historical events of redemption. That's when it becomes the Passover Right, and uh, the two were still uh, done together. Right, they uh, even in the Gospels, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the, the Passover, and uh, the Passover, of course, refers to the the uh, protection of the Israelites during the the horrible, uh, deadly plagues. If you will paint the doorposts and lintels of your home, uh, the uh, the destroying angel will see it and uh, and will not kill your firstborn. It's like saying, we gave it the office. Uh, I don't mean that as some kind of a joke. I think that's exactly the point. The grim reaper, you don't need to, to tax us by killing somebody. Uh, we, we've already had bloodshed of a lamb, though, a substitute for a human being. Uh, it's got to be the first fruits, the firstborn of, of, the, of your sheep, uh, and, uh, and the, the angel of death will pass over you and start killing the firstborn of, of Egypt. Not that they had anything to do with uh, enslaving the Israelites, right? But this isn't a story from the news, right? This didn't happen. Uh, they're just uh, characters in a video game, basically. And again, I, I know it sounds like I'm mocking it. I'm not. I'm saying that you're dealing with a sacred fiction. In, it's like in the, uh, the nativity story of Jesus, uh, where uh, the angel says to Joseph, get your butt and your family out of here tonight because Herod the Great has sent his goon squad after uh, your your new baby to kill him. Uh, so uh, get going quick. Uh, okay. Uh, and what does Herod do? He says, uh, hey, where are those wise men? They were supposed to tell me the address of the newborn king of the Jews, my would-be rival, uh, so I could go and uh, <clears throat> worship him. 
Uh, but they didn't. Well, I'm going to get rid of that kid. Nobody's going to use him as a prop to rebel against me. Oh, we ha we're going to be the regents of the new king. We'll take care of him until he's, we'll take care of the government until he's old enough. But we're going to overthrow Herod the Great. No, we're not letting that happen. So, so uh, we don't know which baby. We don't have the address. We don't know which family. So you guys go up there and kill every kid under two years old because according to the estimate of the of the magi uh the the star that announced the birth uh, they saw it two years before and so just kill them all and let god sort them out uh you wonder well why didn't the angel tell all the parents in bethlehem to get moving because they're because uh, he would have known uh, Herod's plan, right? Uh, he told it to uh, Joseph, right? Uh, so uh, why didn't he? Well, Matthew just wasn't interested in them. They're just uh, extras, right? Uh, he's not really thinking about uh, oh this terrible tragedy that could have avert been averted. To him, the only tragedy that needed to be averted was the death of baby Jesus. The rest of it's just window dressing for that. It's not something that actually happened. Okay. Um, okay, where are we? Oh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yeah, okay. Uh, Peter Rabbit, the guy, oh, wait a minute. The Gospels utilize Paul. The Virgin Mary is an allegory for 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4, where Moses' sister is referenced. I uh, looked that up before the show. Um, here's the passage in question. Um, I want you to know, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses uh, in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food uh, and all drank the same spiritual drink. Um, they, For they drank from the spiritual rock which followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with well, that's it. Uh, uh, that I think you're thinking of. Uh, um, well, this can't be. Let's see here. Let me look at the adjacent passages. Um. Yeah, I, I don't uh, see uh, any uh, reference there. You're probably thinking of a different passage, but a lot of people, I am I feel pretty sure, have said that uh, Mary or Miriam, same name, uh, 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 Moses' sister was the same, uh, uh, like a, uh, a what, what do you say, a, a type for um uh, Miriam or Mary of Nazareth, uh, but um, I, I have to confess I don't really understand the point of typology. It, what does it prove? Uh, I, like Joseph going to Egypt with his family is uh, the anti-type, uh, the the counterpart to the type uh, scene of uh, of Joseph the son of Jacob going in and followed by his family and so on. What what are you talking about? Uh, what do you mean? I mean, I say it is a significant correspondence, but that means that the Joseph story uh, is um, uh, in, uh, in Genesis may be the basis for the, the Matthean Joseph story. Uh, and uh, that's not usually what people want you to think of when they say the one prefigures the other. Uh, Peter Rabbit, uh, Romans 13, dealing with taxation and loving one's neighbor as oneself, as taught by Paul. 
Um, or so are you saying that uh, the Gospels got the similar advice from reading Romans 13? I think uh, David Oliver Smith would agree with you. Um, I am. It takes a little more than that to convince me, but maybe I'm just too suspicious. Ah, okay, Peter Rabbit again. Was Paul ever considered to be the Christ by himself or by his followers? Well, uh, Hugh Schoenfield said he thought that Paul did originally think he was the Messiah, uh, but then he uh, decided, well, no, I guess not. I guess it was Jesus. Uh, I uh, knew of a similar situation to that. Uh, I was working uh, with the Unification Church in dialogue sessions and stuff, and, um, and I read a lot about them. And uh, I sat behind this guy, uh, Dr. David Kim, uh, who uh, had at first believed that he was going to be the Lord of the Second Advent. But then he met Reverend Moon and said, no, I, I got to admit, it's this guy, not me. Uh, so um, Hugh Schoenfield said that something, he didn't have that available at the time, that parallel. But that's pretty much what he said was going on with Saul of Tarsus. Uh, and uh, it is pure speculation, but not without some plausibility, because there, I, I did, uh, I think I explored some of this stuff in uh, The Amazing Colossal Apostle. Paul uh, compares the new covenant with the old and uh, he says, as Moses was the, uh, the mediator of the old covenant, I am the mediator of the new one. Well, not Jesus, you? Uh, that's a pretty high opinion of oneself. Uh, was he a megalomaniac? Well, that's neither here nor there, who knows? But the thing is, that might make you think this guy had entertained that view. Uh, and uh, then in elsewhere in the Pauline epistles, there are strange things like when he says, uh, uh, to the Corinthians. Now, I said I would be back to see you, and when I did, I would put things in order there and deal with the problems, but I was prevented from doing it, and some people are saying, oh, he's never going to show up. Hey, just wait, you'll see, and you may regret having said that once I get there with my, uh, uh, my uh, rod in hand to spank a couple of people. This kind of sounds like the delay of the parousia, uh, only it's Paul's second coming they're worried about. And then there's this thing in Colossians where he says, don't worry if you hear about my sufferings. Really, it's it's good, not bad, because I am completing what is lacking in the atoning death of Christ. <laughs> what? Uh, nobody's ever come up with a good one for that. Uh, but that makes me think that there are hints. Uh, or how about this? He says rhetorically to the Corinthians, uh, I hear there's division among you, my brethren, and I uh, guess I believe it because I hear specifically is one person saying, I belong to Cephas, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Christ. And he said, what, is, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Was Paul, were we baptized in the name of Paul? Of course, he expects a no answer. But that's a very strange situation he's addressing. It sure sounds like he knows that he, even in Corinth, maybe elsewhere, there are not just fan clubs of these other apostle figures, but that there are full-fledged cults that venerated Cephas, Paul, and Apollos um, just as Christians venerated Jesus and that uh, somehow they all finally got together just like the John the Baptist followers were recruited to early Christianity. And they to give uh, John the Baptist a place of honor, they said, oh, oh by the way, we, we tell you that uh, John was Jesus' cousin, so he fits right in, don't you think? You'd fit right in. Well, not all of them did because some stayed uh, independent and they're the Mandeans today. But uh, I think that may be what happened, uh, that these weird remarks I just mentioned are holdovers from 
Christians who had been Paulinists, believing that Paul was the Messiah, uh, and that Apollos, who might possibly have been the contemporary Apollonius of Tyana, uh, whose stories are very much like Jesus in the Gospels, just as Paul's are in the Acts of Paul, second century. Uh, and uh, needless to say, Peter, who was crucified, and so on and so on. Uh, so, uh, yeah, maybe uh, some early Christians had thought Paul was the Messiah. It would not surprise me. And uh, I realize the evidence is piecemeal, and it's impossible to be sure. But you can't turn ignorance into fideism. That is, knowing how things were censored and rewritten uh, in many cases, you can't help wondering if a lot more of that went on than is easily evident in the text. So you, just because you can't be sure doesn't mean you can be sure there's nothing to the suggestion. Right? It has to remain an open question. Uh, but a lot of people don't like that. They, they want to know it's this way and not that way, and they'll bank on it, right? So they, they'll laugh off any possibilities that are strange-seeming to them and that would upset the apple cart. Uh, so um, that is, a, I, I'm, I know it sounds like I'm condemning and criticizing, and to a certain extent I am, but I'm, I, what I'm doing is urging people to remain open open to, to these various possibilities, uh, and uh, they all shed light on one another and uh, make it possible, perhaps, to illuminate certain dark corners of uh, early Christianity. Z. Stallone says, uh, what do you think of the theory by uh, D.M. Murdoch uh, that, get this, John the Baptist may not be historical, but rather the same as Oanes or Ioanes, John, uh, the water god, kind of another Dagon. Also, if John wasn't uh, uh, historical, who taught Simon Magus? Well, that really could have been anybody. You never know. Um, this reminds me of how uh, Paul uh, was uh, coached by Ananias which is a, just a flip of the uh, prefix into a suffix. It means exactly the same thing as Johannan, uh, John. Uh, and uh, it's just, uh, it means gift of Yahweh or Yahweh's gift. Uh, and uh, and this was uh, when uh, and, and he baptizes um Paul as Saul after he's been struck blind on the Damascus Road and so forth. Uh, and uh, where does uh, Ananias of Damascus live? Uh, they actually give his address. He's on Straight Street. What? Why am I thinking of uh, a voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the paths of the Lord? Is there some kind of thing here where we've got a, a retelling of Paul's conversion. I mean, any way you cut it, Acts gives it three times. Is this uh, a fourth one tucked in? I don't know, but weird things have certainly happened. Uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, DM Murdoch, my late good friend, uh, she said this, but I don't think she claimed originality for it. This was a theory of Robert Eisler. I mean, she was very widely read. I, I'm sure she must uh, have known that uh, and credited Eisler with it. Um, but in a little booklet called, the, I think it's the Gnostic John the Baptist, he does say exactly this. I mean, look at the parallels. Oanes uh, or Ioanes, the Greek for uh, Johannan, uh, John, and, and he comes up out of the water onto shore to teach wisdom to men. Uh, I got to admit, uh, that um, sort of sounds plausible to me, but who knows? Uh, hard to say, but I, I think that is uh, well, it's a plausible theory. 
Uh, it's unconfirmable, but you just have to uh, deal with that, as literary critics say. Uh, you can't really know if a particular interpretation of a text is the true reading. Because next week, somebody might say, hey, did you notice this? I think this is what he was getting at, and we've been missing it. Oh, so what do you know? I bet you right. Uh, so you can't really be sure you've got it right. Uh, but uh, what is it you seek in, a, in an interpretation? You're, you're after a strong reading, by which they mean a, a reading, an interpretation of a passage that opens up new possibilities for meaning. And then you can make a case for this or that one as it seems right to you. But a strong reading opens up possibilities in the text that hadn't been noticed before. And sometimes you just uh, having the panorama of uh, an embarrassment of riches about possible meanings is itself the treasure you're looking for. If you want to dogmatize, well, um, you may be disappointed. Uh, so, uh, well, let's see here. Uh, Welsh backgammon. Why the persistent snobbish attitude to the Samaritans? Is it mainly due to them never being part of the exiled elites? Uh, it could be, but uh, the, the biblical reason for it, though this may be ethnic slurs is that these guys were not strict Jews. Uh, they were an admixture of uh, Israelites, uh, the northern kingdom, who uh, weren't deported by the Assyrian conquerors. They didn't depopulate the place. They just took leaders and like that, just like later on the Babylonians did with Judah to the south. Uh, and the Bible says that um, the Assyrians replaced a lot of the people they uh, took because they, they needed farming to continue and because uh, they wanted to tax the, uh, the their conquered people and to uh, um, uh, to get use their resources. You needed a population. And so they tended to play musical chairs with their conquered populations. And they would actually tell them, you know, you probably don't remember this. Uh, maybe they never taught you this, but you, your uh, people are actually from this place that we're sending you back to. So you should feel right at home there. I don't know how many people were convinced by that and could possibly even have been true. Who knows? Uh, but um it certainly wouldn't be unhistorical in principle to say that the Assyrians did bring in a bunch of people from other conquered colonies, and they intermarried with uh, the uh, the conquered Israelites, and that made them mongrels. You see an ugly depiction of this in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and a counterblast to that in the books of uh, Jonah and Ruth who say God is welcoming to anybody. There's no aliens in his eyes um, because they, they didn't like this exclusive uh, pure race uh, stance of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, now, is that true or not? Who knows? They certainly did evolve their Judaism in a different direction. Uh, the Samaritans apparently uh, did not uh, inherit the Jewish Zoroastrianism that Ezra and uh, Nehemiah and, and their folks did. Uh, neither did the Sadducees. And like the Sadducees, the Samaritans didn't have the same biblical canon. They had the Pentateuch, you know, Genesis through Deuteronomy, uh, but it was a, a somewhat different translation. We, we still have them both. Uh, they're largely the same, but there's a few distinctives. Uh, and they have a sixth book, a book of Joshua, but it's nothing like uh, the standard one. Uh, and uh, so it pretty much matches the Sadducee Pentateuch canon. Uh, so um, 
again, that like the Sadducees didn't like Pharisee doctrine because it was Jewish Zoroastrianism. Well, apparently the, the Sa Samaritans who had no contact with the propagation of that stuff by Ezra and Nehemiah felt the same way. I'm sorry, you know, we're, we're not falling for that. Uh, and as a result, like the Sadducees, they had a shorter canon. And uh, th this seemed uh, like heresy to Jews and to Samaritans looking at Jews the same way, like John chapter four, Jesus, a Jew comes up to the uh, well of uh, is it? I forget, uh, no, Jacob's well. And uh, he, he sees a woman drawing water in a bucket and he says, uh, ma'am, may I trouble you for a drink of water? And she says, well, I, I'd like to, but, uh, you know, I can't because you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. I guess they had different clothing styles or whatever. And it's and then John explains, because Jews don't use the same dishes Samaritans use because they've got cooties, right? Oh, well, you're unclean, so uh, ritually unclean by our standards. Uh, well, you are by ours. What a coincidence. So I'm afraid we can't use uh, our uh, dishes or buckets, as the case may be for you. And uh, then Jesus just uses that as a kind of a witnessing wedge to say, well, uh, you know, if you realized who I am and uh, the water I could give you, uh, you would, uh, you know, accommodate me in a minute and uh, you'd never have to, you'd never be thirsty again. Oh, yeah? Uh, where, where do I get this water? And he says, lady, uh, it's the water of truth. It's not actually drinkable. Oh, uh, what a disappointment. Um, oh, I guess one liked Perrier and the other liked, uh, oh, uh, Avion or something. Okay. Um, just a man from the past. Does Zoroastrianism get to count as a world religion? It certainly had a huge impact and is still practiced, though by only 150,000, 1% the size of Judaism. Well, I think you've just explained very compactly why it's considered a world religion. It did have worldwide impact and still exists. Uh, in its day, you could have said, uh, and scholars I think do say, that like Manichaeanism was a world religion. Didn't cover the whole darn globe, but it was a huge amount of territory, and it lasted for about a thousand years before it was stamped out. Uh, so I guess it's sort of the scope and the scale of it that determines it, and the influence of it, the sphere of influence. And uh, whereas uh, you would not say Sikhism is a world religion, Though you might say I consider it part of Hinduism because it is a variation on it, but uh, uh, but if it's really restricted to a particular small group and always was, you know that would deserve respect too. But you wouldn't consider it a, a world religion. But with the big five uh, or the big six, if like me you would add Zoroastrianism, uh, I don't think they'd be too many people that would say that they don't deserve the appellation of a world religion. And again, my book, Houses of the Holy, is coming out and uh, in autumn. we still got a few months to wait. But uh, in it, I, the, the subtitle is uh, A Higher Critical Survey of uh, the World Religions. And I deal with, uh, in as much detail as I could, uh, 12 of these religions. There's uh, Judaism, Zoroastrianism, Christianity, Islam, uh, the Baha'i faith, um, the Druze faith, the Yazidis, the Sikhs, the Jains, and whom I leave it out. Um, um, The, uh, the say the Yazidis and the Mandeans, anyway, there's a dozen of them. And the, not all of those have quite the scope I've just been describing, but I think they're different enough that they are uh, kind of notches on the same belt. Yeah. Okay, um, just a man from the past. 
Could Spanish Catholics have borrowed the practice of naming people Jesus from the Muslim practice of naming people Muhammad? What effects did uh, Muslims in Spain for a hundred years have on Christianity? You got me. I, I just don't know. I'm uh, sorry to say, but this was the what was it the Andalusian period where. Um, in Spain, uh, Jews got along fine, and uh, Christians did, I believe, and they were big into philosophy there, just like the whole Abbasid Caliphate was. Uh, but uh, I, I cannot tell you the uh, if that had any influence on the use of the name Jesus. Um, if anybody does know, please, uh, please correct my ignorance. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, Dirk says, hello, Bob and everyone. Good to have you aboard, Dirk. Yeah, let's see. At uh, top of the evening, Richard says. Uh, same to yourself. Just a man from the past. Was there any theological reason the Orthodox didn't adopt the Gregorian calendar? I have no idea. Everybody is stumping the geek tonight. So again, if you happen to know, please don't, as they say in Monty Python, don't keep it to yourself. Uh, one of two, Vesna says, Dr. Bob, the other day I wrote The Four Horsemen or Christopher Oh. Uh, Richard, Sam, and Dan, of course, you mean uh, Christopher Hitchens, uh, Richard Dawkins, Sam uh, Harris, and uh, Daniel, um, what's his name? Oh, my God. Uh, Dennett, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a bunch. I, uh, it's uh, amazing. Yeah, uh, he said I. I thought it would be funnier just to use the first names, but it didn't work due to my, uh, you know, declining brain. I always uh, used to tell my pal. Um, John Loftus, that he ought to be considered the fifth or now the new fourth horseman. This guy was a disciple of uh, William, William Lane Craig and proved, uh, disproved the gospel maxim that the student is not above the teacher. He, just a man from the past, the Incaridian, better to die of hunger, exempt from grief and fear. Uh, than to live in affluence with perturbation. Uh, that's from uh, the Enchiridion of the Handbook of uh, um, Epictetus, the Stoic. And he says that's almost word for word Ecclesiastes. Yeah, there's probably some uh, dependence one way or another. I, th I think you're right. There is a book, uh, I guess I still have it on the shelf there, Paul and Epicurus, but I've never gotten around to reading it. Uh, shame, shame, shame on the likes of me. Uh, just a man from the past. Better is an is a handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. What strikingly parallel sayings or ideas do you note in religious thinking? Well, that kind of reminds me of something from Proverbs that it's better to, uh, how does it go? eat vegetable stew or something uh, in a peaceful house than to have a steak with a house filled with strife. You know, it's no surprise when you find these uh, maxims of wisdom, because as I said the other day, not originally, of course, it's not my insight, but the human mind is pretty much built the same way all over the place, and the human environments uh, are though they're very different in some ways, will present the same menu of questions and the same raft of possible answers. So it's no surprise you come up with a lot of the same nifty stuff. 
Well, huh. uh, just a man from the past. And thank you, Dr. Robert M. Price, for inspiring me to revisit both Epictetus and Ecclesiastes. Yeah, great. I'm glad you're doing that. Canaanite Acacia says there's a theory uh, that the execution of fornicators was in order to stop the spread of a STD, sexually transmitted disease, which they saw as God's punishment. Whoa, um, boy, that's really uh, the scorched earth approach, I'd say. I never heard that. That uh, makes some kind of sense, even if it is going overboard. Yeah, and Canaanite Acacia continues to talk about draconian disease control methods. Was Anthony Fauci around at that time? I guess that's a little early for, for him. Oh, just a man from the past. Is there any clue as to who the Sabians are, as referenced in the Quran as a people of the book? Well, uh, some people say that this was the seedbed from which Islamic monotheism eventually sprang, that they were trying to get back to a primitive monotheism, which they credited to Father Abraham, which is sort of the same approach taken in uh, the letter to the Galatians, interestingly. But I have read most often that people think the Sabians um, uh, were uh, the, the Mandeans, uh, they the name seems to denote a baptizing sect like the 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 Masbothians, the Hamerobaptists, uh, and others. Uh, and uh, so, if, if there's a decent living counterpart, uh, I think it would be the uh, uh, the the Mandeans. Hmm. Just a man from the past, answering Canaanite Acacia. Supposedly, when asked why so many of his laws called for the death penalty, Draco or Draco, I don't know, said, "I cannot think of a harsher punishment." <coughs> uh, like uh, reminds me of what Rorschach says in uh, the Watchmen. He says, "Used to molly coddle criminals, uh, let them live." And, uh, yeah, boy, what a guy. Somebody asked uh, Steve Ditko once what he thought of uh, Alan Moore's uh, character, Rorschach, which is um, based on Ditko's character, The Question, Vic Sage, who in turn is based on uh, a more uh, ruthless Avenger in uh, self-published comics by Ditko called Mr. A. It uh, was an objectivist and, uh, and uh, Randian and so forth. And uh, Ditko said, well, the big difference is uh, uh, Mr. A wasn't insane uh, because it sort of implies even in the comic that Rorschach has been shocked out of sanity by the horrors he has seen and now has no mercy on criminals and so forth. One of my favorite comics characters. Ooh, uh, what is the name of the type of warding off device Nehushtan was? It's an apotropaic vice, uh, device, an oh, away turning device, A P O T R O P A I C, apotropaic. And, um, and, and there are various others in, in history and so on. Oh, Jay, uh, Roger Sacco, I believe the future unfolds with constant newness where we learn the things we don't know we don't know now. I think John Polkinghorne had this view. Was he the uh, Episcopal bishop or somebody that was a, a theistic evolution or something? A, a evolutionist. Uh, I, if so, I read one of his books in preparation for... Uh, the collaboration I did with uh, Ed Swoman and called uh, Evolving Out of Eden. And if I may say so, this is the definitive book uh, showing how uh, theistic evolution is no better than creationism. 
uh, and uh, both biblically and scientifically. Um, you you got to get this book if you haven't read it already. Evolving Out of Eden. Okay. Um, just a Man from the Past, Roger Sacco, to him, uh, Donald Rumsfeld hit on something clever. There are known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Yeah, that's great. Uh, that's no uh, crack, no uh, paradox. There's certain things where we know the question, but not the answer yet. And there's other ones where we don't even know to ask the question. And uh, yeah, that's well put, I think, by old Rummy. Uh, Roger Sacco says, if the future exists already, you are already dead and buried and beyond that. Not a problem, since living to infinity, uh, we would hate in ways we don't realize. Like in... Oh, what was it? Uh, it's not hell's a poppin', I don't think. But there's some uh, some comedy with uh, Peter, somebody or other, as the devil and the utterly unfunny Dudley Moore. Uh, and uh, Moore has uh, learned the secret of who this guy is, that he is the devil. And he said, what made you fall from heaven oh, boy, that, you're leaving heaven that's uh, why and he says well uh, let me put it this way uh, in heaven all you do all the time is praise God and say oh you are so great or in Monty Python oh Lord you are so big so incredibly huge we're all impressed down here I can tell you so you just ask kissing for all eternity. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. That's going to get pretty tiresome pretty fast. Uh, so what would eternal, infinite life be like? Uh, it might be like the guy in... Uh, that Twilight Zone episode who bargains with uh, the devil to get eternal life and uh, um, invulnerability, but he gives him a, an escape clause in case life becomes unbearable, which it does. Uh, though I'm having a great time in it. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, you know, I think I'm... I thought this might be true. I'm glad you confirmed it. Daniel Hopkins says, no lie. Trump is selling a Bible, including USA founding documents. Okay, yeah. I believe uh, Jerry Falwell did decades ago. And uh, possibly Jim Baker. I, I'm not sure. But yeah, that's right. That's why I was thinking of it. Yeah, I wonder what else. Uh, I, I have to admit, I'm a little uncomfortable with that, though. I I'm a big believer in the inerrancy of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, uh, but I wouldn't go quite that far. Uh, but if you do, I don't care. It's, I appreciate the sentiment. Uh, just a man for the past says uh, to Roger Sacco, time, what is time? Swiss manufacture it, French hoard it, Italians squander it, Americans say it is money. Hindus say it does not exist. Do you know what I say? I say time is a crook. Yeah. Or what does Captain Picard say? Uh, time is the fire in which we burn. Well, he, he didn't agree with it, but somebody said it and he quoted it. Okay. Uh, speaking of quoting scripture, I, I don't want to misrepresent Star Trek. Okay, uh, one of three questions. Genesis says the serpent is cunning or crafty or wily, depending on the translation. Uh, not evil. Uh, this uh, from the Orthodox Jewish Bible. Uh, okay, the second one. Now the Nahash was more arum 
cunning, crafty, wily than any beast of the Sadeh, which Hashem Elohim had made. Nahash means serpent. And then the, uh, the third one. Sadeh means land or field, like where the wild animals live. It also can mean field as in cultivated land. I guess the word field in English is the same way. Yeah. Gee. Uh, oh, Dr. Price, how about raffling off one of your books or comic book characters? You mean action figures? Um, raffling off. You know, I have, believe it or not, a Bible geek figure that a friend of mine surprised me with. And it's old bearded me with a better physique in a Superman costume, only it says BG in the shield. I've been thinking of uh, maybe auctioning that off. Uh, let me think about it. Um, if I have... Uh, well, see, I don't really have extra copies of any of my uh, biblical or religious uh, books. I will, but um, I don't know. Let me think about this. Uh, what does anybody else think? Yeah. And uh, Vesna, ah, is like Rush. He says, this is question number four of three. The thing that strikes me is that... Uh, Yeah, the thing that strikes me is that the snake is just an animal in this story, an animal created by Hashem Elohim, the name of the gods, right? Yep. Uh, simply acting according to its nature. Uh, yeah, I guess that's why the punishment leveled against him really covers all of his progeny throughout history. It's an etiological story saying... Why do we not get along with snakes? We flinch and jump when we see them. We brain them with a with the garden hose, etc. Why? Uh, and uh, well, because they could be poisonous, I guess. But yeah, it it is. Uh, it does have in mind that. But it seems to me the fact that it has wisdom already shows that there's more to this. Uh, the ideological part of it. Uh, does deal with plain old long legless reptiles but uh the idea that he knows better uh about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil seems to me to imply that we're dealing with the, the god nahushtan here oh vesna says uh, peter rabbit's idea is a great one Catholic, uh, christian catholic uh, says the church is the body of Christ, Colossians 1.24, and thus is patterned according to his members with a visible head at the top, uh, the Pope, Matthew 16.18, and the other members below, bishops, priests, etc. Um, yeah, that's uh, an application of that. I, I do think that uh, primacy is given to the, the successors of Peter, in uh, Matthew 16, uh, that it, uh, Peter is the rock. Uh, I don't think, it, though it's not just a Protestant view that uh, Jesus means the gospel or the confession of Peter that he's just made. Uh, Justin Martyr already thought that. But uh, I I find that hard to, to believe. It, it just seems to me it has to be. You, know, you are Peter, uh, and on this rock I will build my church. It almost has to mean that. And uh, when he dies, there's not going to be anybody uh, that holds the keys to the kingdom. The idea, I think that already must refer to uh, a bishop, though probably uh, the head bishop of Antioch, where Matthew was more than likely written. Um, Ephesians does talk about the head of the body. Is that the same context where it says he's apportioned gifts um, and, and lists the offices in the church? Uh, I've never really thought to connect that with the body, though 1 Corinthians certainly does connect that. So maybe it's uh, assumed in Ephesians too.
Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see a response. Uh, yeah, here we go. From uh, just a man from the past to Christian Catholic. Uh, I think it is the nature of any group of members to have a visible head at the top. Okay, uh, Gil von Sempingham. Uh, he says, is Simon Magus the Messiah? Well, in effect, I guess so. Um, in, 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 that he was the redeemer of souls, that he came first to find and rescue the uh, lost soul of the Ennoia, the, the first thought, like the Logos kind of, uh, that had been ca taken captive in the flesh and been reincarnated obliviously many uh, thousands of times. And he finally caught up with her in the stream of history and awakened her to her true identity. And she traveled with him as his uh, his assistant, his consort, whatever, um, kind of like Mary Magdalene and Jesus with the same questions that arise there. Uh, and uh, as the Redeemer, uh, and if he associated himself as having somehow been Jesus, he must have known Jesus is considered the Christ, so he would have been too. Um, so, yeah. Okay. I don't know what that emoji means, that red frowning face. Maybe you could enlighten me, anybody. I don't really use them. <laughs> Just a, <laughs> a man from the past quoting me. Imp uh, what's the word? Uh, paraphrasing what Paul says. Son of a bitch, they're knifing me in the back. And... He says, how often have I said that? Yeah, oh, I know the feeling. Boy, do I know it. Hmm. Just a man from the past. Share Dr. Robert and Price's content whenever you can. Not only is it beneficial for anyone to be aware of the good doctor, it makes you look smart to be a known fan of his. Ooh, I, I'd like to think so. And William Graves says, uh, uh, pity. Oh, that's the, uh, the, the meaning of that emoji. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, William. Um, and then he says, no concept means nothing. Uh, no, uh, no Greek, um, uh, Romans and Zeus. You don't know nothing. Well, if you're a Zen Buddhist, you might. Uh, oh, uh, Jesus is a liar. Um, Jesus says, come and join paradise, a trap. John the Baptist and Jesus are cousins, a trap, uh, and so forth. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, then... Uh, Low Rhymer, did did Litwa send you his book on Simon Magus yet? Nope, oh, never heard of it. Ooh, got to look that up. When I have a few bucks, I'll have to buy a copy. Uh, okay, Satan uh, has joined the august ranks of being a member of Wise as a Serpent. Thank you. You honor us with your participation. I hope you feel it was a wise choice, as I'm sure it will be. Okay. For your information, oh, Austin O'Keefe says, for your information, nobody in Ireland ever says top of the morning or top of the evening. They don't? My faith is shattered. Oh, boy. Uh, well, they probably don't actually speak as I do when I'm doing my lame uh, Scottish, uh, Irish accent uh, imitation. So, you know, what the heck? Uh, hang for a, what does it say? I can't remember the rest of that proverb. Oh, boy. Uh, hmm. Austin, Peter Rabbit says. 
Not sure I get that. Uh, let's see. Peter Abbott says, no, wait, wait. This is this is Andrew Good, Gooding. I remember a Christian fundamentalist telling me on a forum that the Good Samaritan was in hell. Is that a common opinion in those days? I've never heard of that. <laughs> what put him there? Uh, <laughs> Boy, I'd, I'd love to know what led to that. I just love hearing uh, opinions that I never would have guessed anybody uh, held. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Mm. Um, okay. With no, uh, Daniel Hopkins says, with no due respect, Falk that Falcon Fauci. <laughs> okay, Daniel Hopkins also says Masbothians or truthers from Arabic Masboot or uh, huh? what's the oh with an S or Masboot with a Z. True, exact. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Uh, just a man from the past. Be oh, yeah, bedazzled is what you're thinking of with Dudley Moore. I like the film. Yeah, all I remember is that line and Dudley Moore, whom I can't stand. I'm I'm not passing judgment on the film. I don't even remember anything but that scene. Oh, see, uh, Stad Enthusiast says, I'm a secular humanist, parenthesis, agnostic, atheist, whatever. However, I would like to believe there is something beyond this material existence. Yeah, as long as it's not hell, I'm with you there. Uh, let's see. Oh, Just a Man from the Past, uh, Bedazzled, uh, was remade in 2000 with Elizabeth Hurley as the devil. The Twilight Zone episode is Escape Clause, one of the best, uh, though I would have waited out prison instead of going to hell. <laughs> yeah, boy. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Canaanite Acacia says, keep the figure and auction signed books. Okay, you want the feedback. I want more of it. I appreciate it. Austin O'Keefe. I had a debate about the Noah flood story being a myth copied from the Sumerians. Sumerians or Samaritans? It could be either one, the way you spelled it. She said it could have been in Jewish oral tradition earlier. Have we more proof of it being copied? Uh, well, it's, uh, I guess anything is possible. Um, it probably predates the Gilgamesh epic in which it's found now. But uh, the theoretical possibility that uh, the Noah version is earlier uh, seems to me to be without evidence. I mean, it's possible you could find it in an earlier, still earlier uh, source um, or as an oral tradition, but I don't know how you would demonstrate that. So as to say that it is copied from uh, the, the Utnapishtim uh, flood story uh, is uh, a tentative judgment like all historical judgments are, but as far as we know from the relative dates of the sources we have, uh, the uh, the Sumerian version appears to be earlier, but well, we don't know for sure. Daniel Hopkins, Dr. Price is like a home-cooked meal with all the fixings, or somebody who has eaten the home-cooked uh, meal with all the fixings. Yeah, okay, great. Um, Canaanite Acacia, something like that figure is truly one of a kind, and it has more emotional value to you than anyone else. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Um, uh, Low Rhymer says, Bhagavad Gita, man. I guess that means you like it. It is great stuff. There is a really powerful section where Krishna reveals his divine form. It is just uh, sublime. Uh, let's see. Uh, hmm. Okay. 
Hello, Reimer. Is Matthew using Jesus to mock Peter by promising so much? You're the rock. Here are the keys to the kingdom of heaven, as the audience already knows that Peter will deny him still. I don't think so. I think he's he's trying to rehabilitate Peter because uh, the, the tradition or the story already exists in Mark that uh, uh, Peter gets an A for identifying Jesus correctly as the Christ, which makes it all the worse that he denies knowing him later. Um, and what does Matthew do? He adds the blessing. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Rather, my father in heaven. And uh, I give you the keys of the kingdom, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. It's like uh, he knows what's ultimately going to happen, uh, but um, Mark also anticipates a resurrection appearance and a reunion between Jesus and the disciples, and that he says it, he predicts it before the angel tells uh, the women about it, he predicts it at the Last Supper, uh, what, uh, after it's, you'll, we'll meet again in Galilee after I am... Uh, uh, executed and so forth. Well, if that in the same occasion, he also tells Peter, Oh, you're that loyal, are you? You would die for me. Well, I happen to know, uh, that uh, this very night before Rooster Crow, uh, you will have denied me not once but three times. Uh, and um, so it's already in view when they anticipate that all will be forgiven. Jesus uh, must be forgiving. I'm it'd be really weird if uh, he was uh, saying, I'll meet you there, and boy, am I going to give you hell when I do. Uh, that seems to me not to be in view. So he's taking uh, as much of what Mark already had and trying to ease the blow uh, though it is interesting that a couple of chapters later, he's given the keys to the kingdom to the whole College of Apostles. There's a great book about this called Peter in Matthew uh, by Arlo J. Initial Now, if you say it this way, I don't know, N-A-U, Arlo J. Now. A fascinating book about the different levels of redaction dealing with Peter in the Gospel of Matthew, and it gets into this kind of stuff. Great, great stuff. Oh, okay. Did we have that one? Um, Andrew Gooding. The Good Samaritan thing, because he hadn't... Oh, my God. Are you kidding? Uh, why is the Good Samaritan in hell, according to somebody? Because he hadn't accepted Christ as his savior. The guy might have been a Calvinist, uh, the guy that said this. Does he think that this was actually a news item that, uh, let's say, Jesus read in the Galilee Gazette? Uh, <laughs> he hadn't accepted Christ as his savior. Uh, well, uh, since Jesus hadn't died yet, uh, I don't know how he could have accepted him as his savior. Right. That's a weird one, boy. That takes the cake. Ah, let's see. Thank you. And, uh, oh boy, I tell you, Welsh backgammon, a fellow Welshman, uh, has become a uh, member of our YouTube uh, club. Great. Mighty, mighty appreciative of that. And then, uh, Um, just a man from the past. Uh, the Randy Newman song, The Great Debate, would make an appropriate intro. Uh, welcome, welcome to this great arena, Durham, North Carolina, the heart of the research triangle. I don't know that song. I have a hunch that's uh, a play on it. Yeah, you know, I have used for the Bible Geek. Uh, Russia's Tom Sawyer and ACDC's uh, Highway to Hell. 
And uh, uh, let's see, just a man for the past. We've come to this particular place tonight. Here's more of the song, I think, because we got to look at things from every angle. We need some answers to some complicated questions if we're going to get it right. Well, if that's the case, the uh, song would be a good one for us. Uh, Z Stallone was King David modeled after Alexander the Great? And was there a potential romantic relationship with uh, Jonathan like Alexander and Hephaestion uh, or Achilles and Patroclus? Uh, uh, yeah, that those are precedents that uh, would certainly make sense of when... Uh, I think David says to Jonathan, my love for you is greater than that for of a man for a woman. But it also could just mean that um, I like you better than my wife. Like, uh, what's his name says on Deep, Deep Space Nine? Uh, oh, uh, the engineer. Uh, what the heck is his name? Uh, 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 He's talking with Julian Bashir, the doctor, and they're they're always doing stuff on the holodeck, uh, reenacting historic battles and stuff. And uh, Miles, right? He uh, that it's a question of uh, him spending time with him, and uh, he says, "Well, you you like me better than you like uh, your wife," and he says, "Well, uh, maybe I do." Um, uh, that kind of creeps me out, to tell you uh, the truth. Uh, I mean. My wife is uh, like a limb on the body. Uh, she uh, is me. Uh, she is certainly my best friend. Uh, let's see here. Oh, about Alexander the Great. Uh, I think I've heard that suggested. I believe I've also heard it suggested that Solomon might be based on Alexander the Great, but our buddy M. David Litwa, no, 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 it's uh, another buddy, uh, Russell Gmerkin, has, I think, definitively shown that uh, Solomon is just another version of uh, Shalmaneser III, the Assyrian emperor. Uh, so that, was there a historical Solomon? Yeah, uh, he was an Assyrian emperor. Uh, so interesting. Uh, <laughs> Jordy, speaking of Star Trek, says, anyone else think Dudley Moore looks like Sir Thomas Moore in the Renaissance painting? I'm not sure I've ever seen that. Yeah, Miles O'Brien is the engineer. Yeah, thank you. Man, just a man from the past. Yeah. Can't believe I forgot that. Uh, say 10 says, I love this Dr. Price uninterrupted commentary format, like subjoin. Oh, like subscribe join. I see. Yeah. 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 I appreciate that. Yeah. I sure love doing this stuff. Okay. Well, that's it for tonight. We've gone virtually exactly uh, two hours. So I uh, guess uh, that's pretty much it. And I'll see you tomorrow at noon on Good Friday for uh, more uh, Acts of the Apostles.